Hello, everybody. Welcome. <clears throat> um, today, we'll wait for some people to show up for sure, but um, today I want to talk about uh, Salado Pottery. If you saw my last video, uh, I talked a little bit about um, making Salado Pottery, and so uh, today I'm going to talk about not only the the parts that you need and kind of how I do it, but um, then I'll I can demonstrate some stuff. So uh, I have another camera set up, and let's see if I can do this. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, that and that. So then see if I if I turn on the other camera. I've got a bowl here that uh, I made last night, and I will slip and polish that. And uh, I've got I've got some slip. I got some slip ready here, some of the white slip and some of the red and uh, organic paint. So I'll be talking about these different materials, these different tools that I'm using. Um, I've got a number of pots to show you. Let me transition back. I've got a number of pots to show you uh, about, um, you know, the, the effects we're trying to achieve uh, ultimately and then I also have a little video to show you about uh, how I fire this stuff so hopefully um, you can get something out of it and uh, Q&A uh, you know if you have questions just go ahead and ask them and I will get to those as they come in if I can all right Chris in Kansas is here hey Chris uh, Alexander John Ooh, that's a toughie hi and thank you oh you're welcome Alexander and uh, BJ is here from South Carolina welcome uh, Mark Gibson, Thrive and Survive, waiting for the others to get a bed. So, uh, yeah, looks like we've got a few people here. Uh, what do we got here? Um, concurrent viewers, like eight, I think. So, anyways. Um, all right. So, uh, if you saw my last video, um, I'm kind of focusing on, at least for part of this uh, new series, or this new season, I'm kind of focusing on a Salado Polychrome. So Salado Polychrome was a type of pottery that was made here in the American Southwest uh, about 1275 to 1450. And those are kind of, those are kind of fuzzy numbers. Um, and so it's, uh, it's unique. Uh, up down here, you know, in my area, I live in Tucson, but all of, you know, the Southeast quarter of Arizona, you know, it was almost entirely red on brown pottery for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, from maybe 700 AD all the way up to into the 1200s. Red on brown, red on brown, red on brown. 99.9% .9 of all decorated pottery, well, there's red on buff over in Holcomb area, which is just, you know, a lighter shade of brown, right? Um, and then that's what they made when it came to decorated pottery. You go up on the Colorado Plateau, you're looking at uh, ancestral Puebloan or Anazazi groups up there, and you have a great variety of pottery types. You have black on reds, you have um, black on whites, uh, you have even polychromes, you know, before 1250, you know. So um, when this stuff started showing up down south, um, you know, it, it blew everybody's socks off because not only was it a black on white, but, uh, you know, had this beautiful red areas as well. And, and it was just, um, I mean, they had red pottery, but uh, all together on one pot, I mean, people lost their minds. And, 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 and over the course of, uh, what is it, 150 years this stuff was made, people went from, from making red and browns to, to not making any pottery. So uh, a lot of villages, they would just import this. This stuff was only made in, in certain places, right? So a lot of villages didn't even, by 1450, were not making any decorated pottery. They were just trading for it. And they were making utilitarian ware. They were making plain ware. Uh, but this stuff was, in a lot of cases, you know, probably made by specialists in certain villages who knew the techniques. So 1450 comes... Um, some kind of social disruption, probably war, you know, something bad happened, Ca something catastrophic happened. The trade routes are cut off. You can't get this special white slip and they stop, they stop making decorated pottery because this is what they'd been making for 150 years. You know, a lot of this stuff was no longer made after that. Uh, hello from Shoal, New Mexico, Salinas Pueblo Mission Country. Oh yeah, I love it over there. I love the Salino, Salina, Salinas, Salinas. So I don't know how to say it. I get confused because one's in, they say it one way in Kansas and another in California. So anyway, uh, those Grand Salinas, Grand Crivera missions over there in, in uh, uh, New Mexico, right on the edge of the plains. If you haven't been there, that is a 
great place to visit. Some really awesome ruins, uh, and you know, and, and stuff, old stuff, and then newer stuff, stuff that was done after the Spanish had arrived. So, um, yeah, really cool stuff. Hello from Flintland in Poland. Right on. We've got somebody here from Poland and Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hey, Liz. Uh, so, uh, so this stuff is unique and it's it's kind of interesting. And, and when I first started doing replication. Um, you know, nobody was really doing this kind of stuff. Um, the, the Thornburgs had done, I think, a few Salado pieces. When I was at their house in the, the late 80s, early 90s, I definitely saw one or two pieces of, of Salado polychrome that they'd made. And, um, but that wasn't what they did on a regular basis. Their, their bread and butter was Membrus and Holocom. Uh, so black and white, uh, red on buff. Uh, and, and so... You know, I really wanted to do this, and I, I spent a lot of time researching it. So it's fun for me uh, this season to to bring a lot of polychrome to you, and maybe encourage some of you to try making it yourself. And as somebody who spent a lot of time um, experimenting with different materials and firing methods and, and these kind of things in trying to replicate this stuff, um, it'll be interesting to me to see how others go about doing it or what kind of successes you have trying different things like firing it in an electric kiln or that sort of thing. Um, Alan Beal. Hey, Alan. Hey, Andy. Great to see you. Good to see you, Alan. Uh, it's hard for me to paint with clay. All clay, I find, turns red, but the yellow clay. Yeah, okay, so um, that's true. A lot of clay, a lot of places, you know, uh, like South Carolina might be one of those areas. I, honestly, it's one of the states I've never been to, but... Um, you may find all the clay is very similar in color. And so um, you may travel a little bit to find different colors of clay. Or, you know, you might be happy to just order some clay off the internet and, and be happy that you have some different colors. Um, one of the things I do to get different colors is, is minerals. So, um, like, I use manganese dioxide to make black paint. And I can collect that, you know, about four hours from here in New Mexico. You know, but if you don't have manganese dioxide mines in your area that you could visit, you can order manganese dioxide off the internet and you know that's kind of the same thing they're just mining the mineral and grinding it up for you it still comes straight from the earth so. um, Sharon Bryant uh, hey from West Texas wish we had Native American pottery here oh you have, you have to have uh, Native American pottery in West Texas I would think I mean East Texas has the Mississippi and stuff and far West Texas like you know uh, El Paso and Van Horn and out that way, they have, um, uh, what is that, Me Mogion, um, what do they call those Mogion group out there? I can't say it now. They just had the, the conference for them. Hornada Mogion, is that right? Hornada? I think that's it. Uh, like El Paso Polychrome and that kind of stuff. I bet you have, I bet you have uh, some kind of pottery out there. In fact, if you're in West Texas, go up to those um, uh, Salinas Mission Pueblos up in uh, New Mexico. Those aren't terribly far from West Texas, and that'll inspire you. There's some beautiful pottery up there. Uh, hello from North Caucasus. Like the Caucasus, like like Eastern Europe. Uh, if so, that's that's really cool. Uh, Moss Vitin Alexander. Your name sounds like probably Eastern Europe too. Uh, yes, I have an old Pueblo on my ranch here. Question, can I use a kale and slip from clay I found near Bishop, California? Will it work with plant-based paints? Um, Jeffrey, be careful with the word kaolin because um, a lot of people, I mean, archaeologists are really terrible about this, for one. They like to, like, if they see a white clay, they'll say, oh, that's kaolin because it's white. And, and not all white clay is kaolin, um, you know. So... Just because it's white, don't assume it's kaolin. Maybe you've had this tested and you know it's kaolin or, you know, it has the properties of kaolin or something. So um, try it. I would say experiment with it. If it is truly kaolin, I don't believe it'll work with organic paint. Uh, what you really want is a smectite clay for um, the organic paint. But if you just found a white clay, and don't assume it's kaolin. You know, test it. Make a test tile or a little test, you know, like, uh, let me show you what I did. Uh, where did those go? Here they are. I, uh, I make these little cylinders because I can make these real fast and then I'll just I'll just paint on them with different colors of organic paint or different materials you know and then just test fire it and I can do that real fast I can see if a slip works I can see if a if an organic paint works so um test it out Bishop you could easily find smectite in Bishop there's uh, there's 
volcanic activity in that area, I think. Um, I almost moved to Bishop one time. That's another story. Okay. Uh, so let me first explain. Um, this is the pot that I fired at my workshop last weekend. And this is another one. And then I also did this bowl. So I'm going to use these for examples uh, throughout the lesson today. And um, I have some others too. And I'm going to talk about, I'll get to firing last. I'll do, um, I'll do uh, slipping and polishing uh, and then painting and then firing. I'll try to do it in order. Okay. So uh, let me change the camera here. Mm, if I can. You'll capture Okay. So now you should be looking at my workspace. And this is the bowl I made yesterday. Um, this is my, I'm going to set it back in the pookie so I don't flatten the bottom out. So as, as long as that clay is a little soft, I'd rather not set it on a flat surface because I, I want to keep the bottom rounded. So I'm going to set it back in the pookie, which in this case is a wooden bowl. Uh, and so this is my slip. This is the, the smectite slip that I collect up near uh, St. John's, Arizona. It comes from the side of the highway and it looks very gray. In fact, uh, in its raw state, let me grab a piece of that. In its raw state, I think it actually looks kind of purple. I don't know if you're getting the colors on that very good because of the lighting here. Um, so this is what I'm currently selling on my website if you want to try that. And like I said, it looks very gray, but this, this is that material fired. So you can see, I mean, it's not stark white. It's kind of off-white, antique white, kind of creamy, a little bit yellow or pinky, a little bit, a little bit oxidized. But um, so it doesn't stay gray. It fires a whitish color. So um, don't be thrown off by the gray color. And there's different ways to apply this. You can apply it with a brush if you want. Um, and you want to keep it real thin because uh, this stuff has a high shrinkage rate. And when it shrinks, it'll crackle. So um, you keep it super, super thin. And on the, on the prehistoric stuff, you can often uh, see through the slip. And so that's what I'm going for. So like on this one, right in this area, you can see the brown clay shining through. It's not that uncommon to see places where the brown shines through, and um, and that's what you want because that's what you see in the in the prehistoric record. So in this case, I'm going to just apply this with my finger, and I've got it fairly thin, maybe like you know like cream. I don't have it as thin, and it's not thick like yogurt or anything. And I'm just smoothing it on with my finger. And I'll probably do a couple of different coats this way. Uh, I won't just do one coat. And what I want to make sure when I do this, I, I still want to make sure that it's that the pot is damp, kind of leather hard. But I don't want it to be so damp that it's sticky and I'm dredging up the brown clay as I run my finger across it. You know what I mean? So uh, I want it to be relatively firm. Uh, and and you are gonna, I mean, you are gonna naturally dredge up a little bit of that brown. But hopefully with your second coat, then less so, and you can get a good white. The more brown you mix with it, you know, accidentally, um, the more tan colored your, your slip's going to come out of the firings. You don't want that necessarily. And it has a good texture. It's easy to apply this way because uh, it's real creamy. It's nice and smooth. Now I um I literally cut my fingernails this morning because at the bottom like I don't want to scratch it as I apply it, you know. And it's it's easy to do. It's in fact, I might try my thumb. And I know there's some comments there and I'll get to those in a, as soon as I'm done here, okay? I can see them, but I'm, I just want to finish what I'm doing. The bottom of the bowl can be a little bit challenging to reach. If it was a little deeper, uh, I might actually have to use a brush on this. And it looks like there's a lot of relief now. I've got a little on the rim. I'm just going to wipe that off. It looks like you see, when you look at the clay in there, you see a lot of relief, a lot of little bumps, you know. Um, but what you have to understand is when you're applying wet slip like this, most of that relief is just water. So as it dries, uh, it flattens right out pretty well. 
So I'm, I mean, I'm paying attention to areas that are bumpy and kind of smoothing them, but what I'm saying is it's, it's not, not the end of the world if you've got a few bumpy areas because um, when that dries, it's going to be much, much flatter. And, um, and I'm just going to leave it um, and come back to it for a second coat later. And sometimes if, you're, if it is kind of rough or bumpy in places later, you can take, after it's dried a little bit and firmed up, you can just take a wet finger, just dip your finger in water, and you can just smooth that out pretty well. I think, I don't know what the prehistoric people were using. I don't think there's a lot of evidence one way or the other, but I think a finger works pretty good for this. And then I will always uh, try to get it off the rim because the rim's going to be slipped with red and I don't want that white getting into it. Sometimes I'll just, uh, I'm going to wet my finger here and just get a little water and just, oh, my finger is so covered in slip. Hold on, let me wipe this off. I need to wash my hands before I try to clean it. Uh, so then I'll just get the excess off of the rim with a wet finger um, because like I said that's going to be slipped red and I will show you the red slip in just a minute so that's how I do the white slip uh, let me go back to uh, all right uh, got some questions here a bunch of them um, Yes, Europe. We have local ancient pottery here, thousands of years old. Thanks to your lessons, I found a lot of local clays. That's awesome. Yeah, they, I mean, you'll find ancient pottery almost any place in the world. And um, I'm certainly not proposing that everybody make Southwest style pottery. I'm, I'm more an advocate of, uh, like John Olson said in the video I did on him not long ago, um, doing what's local to you, you know, digging into your own history and, and ancient pottery types. Um, Mark Gibson, can't find brown here where clay naturally here in New Mexico. My clay is very white and fires to a higher temp than brown where clay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no. Um, no, uh, Mark, that, that brown is going to allow you to fire at low temps. And the low temps are going to keep that, oxid that organic paint from burning out. So uh, it is important. I don't know what part of New Mexico you're in, but... Um, there is brownware clay in New Mexico. In fact, Mark, you know, you could go to New Mexico Clay, the company. Uh, they have offices in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and you can order online from them. And they have a good brown earthenware clay that you could try, and it is local to New Mexico. Uh, Wayne, hi from Oklahoma. Hey, Wayne. I used to live in Oklahoma. I love it there. I like, um, I like the people in Oklahoma. The weather is a little screwy. Uh, Crow Studios. I use several different color oxides to paint and then burnish them in but still haven't fired. I noticed the paint rubs off still. Will this change after firing or is it doomed to come off? You know, uh, a woman, now, I uh, I burnish it in pretty good and that's what that is. That's just uh, red ochre just powered in. And uh, and I don't usually have problems with it coming off when I power it in real good. Um, but there was a woman in my workshop uh, last week, uh, Sandy, and, and hers was still coming off uh, you know and after the firing we wiped it with a with a rag and a little bit was still coming off on the rag so I don't doubt that that was a problem that the prehistoric potters had as well of course by the time we find the shirt 700 years later all the fugitive material has come off so if that was me and I, I can't say that I've had that problem um, I would after the firing I would just wash as much of it off as you can I think you'll still find that there is some permanent red there. Um, but I, I think, then this is just judging by Sandy, my student's experience and, and my own thoughts on it, that she burnished it too late and the clay was already getting very firm and wasn't really accepting it. So if you, if you start early, start while it's still quite, and I'm going to show you here in a little bit, while it's still quite soft so that you can press that in there, that might make a difference. And, you know, try different things, Crow, but that would be my suggestion. Uh, David. Does the paint have to be absorbed by the clay to stick? Um, that's a good question. So are we talking about organic paint, I assume? Um, I always paint my organic paint uh, when it's bone dry because I have this idea in my head that I want it to absorb. Um, but I, I haven't done enough experimenting to know. Like, it would be fun to experiment and try painting like, you know, like this little test cylinder, right? Like paint some of this while it's still damp 
and then paint some more when it's bone dry and see if there's a difference, right? Maybe not. Maybe it's just as long as that organic paint, because it's going to stick. It's sticky stuff. Um, the question is, will it turn black if it doesn't absorb? And I, it's just a theory. I, I think it needs to absorb, but I, I think experimentation would show. Crow Studio, $5. Thank you so much, Crow. Uh, yeah, all you guys, um, if you could hit the like button for me, that'll help me out a great deal. Uh, so could I paint sedimentary rock with it? Uh, with organic paint? Um, yeah, you could paint on rock, but I mean, you're not firing rocks, are you? I don't, I'm not sure where you're going with that, David. Uh, Jeffrey, I have fired it in, ooh, I don't know that word, Anagama kilns? It's definitely kaolin. But how to find smectite in nature near Shoals, New Mexico? What are its characteristics used to identify in the field? So, uh, smectite clay is formed by volcanic ash that has chemically weathered into clay. Um, so if you go up to like uh, Santa Domingo Pueblo, for example, since that's, you know, there in New Mexico, uh, the clay that they use to make traditional Santa Domingo and Cochiti black on white pottery is, or they use Rocky Mountain bee plant organic paint and they paint it on bentonite clay slip. At least that's what uh, uh, Ann Shepard said in her book was that it was bentonite. So, um, and that area is very, of course, you probably know that's very volcanic in that area. And, near the Pueblos, you know, up in the Albuquerque, Santa Fe area. So, um, bentonite clay slip. I'm getting this stuff over um, in the Chinle Formation over um, in Arizona, like little Colorado River. And there's quite a bit of it over there that holds organic paint as well. So I think once you get in an area where there's a lot of that volcanic ash that's turning into clay, you may do some samples and find a number of them that work. Um, and you might be able to just order, you know, Montmorillonite off the internet too. Um, Granny Goose, oh my gosh, we're live. I'm so jazzed. Cool. Uh, thanks for coming, Granny Goose. Insect droppings on our crepe myrtle are sticky. Boiling the stems and leaves produced a great syrup. Uh, insect droppings. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you're crazy. Anything's worth a try. I just don't know what you're going to get. I don't know anybody that's tried such a thing. Um, but I've used a lot of different plants. I've used, um, you know, sunflower and um, different fruit like yucca fruit and uh, prickly pear and mesquite beans, which are essentially kind of a fruit because it's not the bean, it's the whole pod. Um, a Rocky Mountain bee plant, tansy mustard. And, um, you know, so I think, I think almost any plant will work. I have no idea about insect droppings, but, you know, hey, I, I'm all open to experimentation. That's what it's all about. Uh, Mark Gibson, thanks. I prefer to dig the clay. I'm near Acoma. Oh, good Lord. Um, let's see. Do I know anybody that uses organic paint in Acoma? Uh, so my friend Bobby Silas, I don't know if you saw the video about Bobby. Um, he was trying to do some organic paint uh, up at the Kiln Conference. And this was painted with Zuni white slip. And you can see, uh, you know, it didn't hold it all that good. It's okay. Uh, it just, it just kind of washed out. And so it, it holds it, but not really well. Um, now, I have a friend at Cochiti that I think is using something that comes from Laguna, which is very close to Acoma. Um, so I'd have to check with him, but I, I think he is using something from Laguna that's working pretty good. So uh, I think there is stuff in your area, but it, you know, it took me a lot of years of experimentation to find. I, I appreciate that you're trying to find your own but it may take you some experimentation to figure out what works. Um, you know, and there's the stuff in Colorado that all the Anazazi replicators use um, up in the Four Corners area. They all go up to uh, Cannonball Mesa up by Cortez and, and get white slip and that holds organic paint fairly well too if, if that's not terribly far from you. Uh, and if you're near Acoma, it's not, you know, a couple hours maybe, I would think. Uh, Sarah, hello from Saudi. Thank you for sharing this wonderful knowledge. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate you coming along. Uh, Jeff Cooper, doggone it. At work, going to have to watch later. Okay, Jeff. Uh, too bad you got to work today. Uh, Wayne, did you do pottery in Oklahoma? Uh, you know, like I said, I tell people I've been doing this for 30 years, but it's kind of off and on. So, um, during the time I was in Oklahoma, I, I did not ever try pottery. And, and I had... I lived on about four or five acres outside of town, and, and every time I dug a hole, it was there was red clay down there. So I was sitting on top of clay. I just was busy doing other things, raising sheep and raising dogs and 
raising kids, you know. So um, I do know a, a potter, a really good native potter that lives there real close to where I used to live. Um, what is his name? He's a... Uh, See, I get all I get all stressed out from the live stream, and then I can't remember things. Um, can't say it. He's a native guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's totally gone right now. It'll hit me as soon as we're done. Uh, Sarah, I saw a documentary about some African potters. They don't use a kiln. They say it makes the pots crack when they cook it with open fire. Well, well, Sarah, how are they firing it? In an open fire or something? That's what I do, but you know, uh, oxide sunflower works like a charm. Uh, if you, look, yeah, you know those those little roadside sunflowers, wild sunflowers work great. Uh, that's true. I mean, when they cook it in it after the first firing. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of things will will crack pottery, and and temperature is one of those things for sure, Sarah. Uh, let me go on with what I was showing you real quick before we run out of time. Um, so here's the outside of my pot. I slipped the white on the inside. And usually I will finish the slipping of the inside before I do this, but um, trying to be expedient here and show you the whole process. Here is my uh, yucca brush. This is a, a yucca leaf that I have rotted the fibers loose on the end there. And this is my, uh, this is just, um, this is just red ochre. There's no clay in this at all. And I have it mixed up uh, fairly thin, very watery. And then I'll just, um, I'll just paint it on here real quick and then I'll come back in a little bit hopefully before our um, live stream is over and I'll show you how I polish it now this clay is still pretty soft but that's kind of how I do it when it's still really soft uh, you can really press those particles in there but you just have to be a little gentle with it that you don't you know misshape in your pottery so I'll show you how I do that and I collect this stuff uh, in central Arizona. And this particular batch came from, um, excuse me, the Sierra Anches, uh, which are a mountain range there in um, central Arizona. Back in the day, uh, I worked for the Forest Service years ago, and um, I worked, the, the Sierra Anches was my, uh, the country where I worked fighting forest fires. I was on the um, Pleasant Valley Hot Shots up there. Yeah, as you can see, it's real runny. It it uh, it'll it'll run in a second if you give it a chance. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna get this painted down fairly low, and then I'm gonna set it back in the pookie to get the top because um, I can't reach it obviously sitting on this piece of cloth. And the reason I set it on a piece of cloth is um, to keep from scratching that rim up on my workbench, you know. And I just, I mix it a lot. Every time I reach in, I kind of mix it a little because uh, because it's just mineral, powdered mineral, uh, it will, it'll settle quickly. So I just try to keep it mixed. I'm almost there. And this is um, this is really nice red. I have some other stuff I get from the San Pedro that's a little bit uh, browner, but they both work pretty good compared. So like I'm always comparing my work to the uh, uh, you know the prehistoric record, the ancient sherds, and uh, I think the color is pretty close to what the ancient Salado potters were getting. And that's you know that's what makes me happy. That's the that's success to me is getting close to uh, the ancient record. I'm gonna add. A, oh, oh! I almost spilled it. Good lord, Cato. That's what my friend in Oklahoma. He's a Cato potter, and um, and he does really beautiful work. And he lives uh, right there in the same community where I used to live, which is Bing, Oklahoma. And he does really amazing work. I'm, you know. Facebook friends. I, I, he's not a personal friend or anything. I, I don't, I've never met the guy. I didn't know him when I lived there. I, I kind of found out about him since then. I'm not sure if he was living there or making pottery when I lived in Bing. Oh, I'll put the lid on this. Okay, so that's done. I'll let that sit and firm up a little bit because it's, it's pretty wet right now. And uh, I'll go back to your questions. Um, okay, I've got a bunch here. 
Uh, so uh, B1 Battle Droid says, hello. Hello, B1 Battle Droid. Roger Dickinson, what's the difference between sintering and vitrifying, and which one do you do with primitive firing? Oh, good Lord. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I used, uh, I hear the word sintering used regarding like uh, iron becoming hard on a pot and vitrifying, I hear the word used towards clay, but I don't have a degree in ceramics. I have, I have no idea. I'd have to look it up myself. I could be totally ruined, you know, using them wrong for all I know. Uh, David, sorry for the poor question. I wanted to know if it makes sense to paint stone with organic or other natural paints, which I can find in Texas. I'm asking for an architecture project. Well, sure. Um, you could paint with, with organic paint on it if you were just doing some painting. It's going to stay forever, I would think, unless maybe, you know, insects ate it or something. And you can mix it with pigment, too. So you could take that organic paint, that sticky paint, and add in iron oxide or manganese or limonite or some, you know, uh, carp, copper carbonate, things, you know, colors, and, and use them for paint. I would think it'd make a great binder uh, for anything. David, Granny Goose, uh, I'm in the Central Valley, California, lots of clay, all gray, but other supplies are lacking. Uh, well, I would think, Granny Goose, that, um, I mean, there's so much mining activity in, in California that I think if you use, like, uh, Mindat, I think Mindat.org is that website, uh, you know, you could find old mines in California that had, you know, iron oxides and those kind of things if you wanted because um, there is a lot of mining in California. Uh, Alan got wild sunflowers cooking now. Good deal. Um, let me know how those come out. Roger Dickerson, your hands and the work you're doing are below the bottom of the frame. Can't see. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? I was. I'll try to be more careful when I go back and do the polishing. I apologize for that. It's easy to when you're focused on your work, you know, to forget about uh, the camera angle. And I do that kind of stuff a lot um, because I do a live stream like a Zoom class every Wednesday. It, you know, it's common for me to get out of frame and not realize it. Like focus on two things at once. Uh, Mark Gibson's uh, Richard Zane Smith is in Oklahoma. Makes some of the most amazing corrugated pottery. Yeah, he is super, super talented. Richard Zane Smith is is amazing. And uh, I knew he was in Oklahoma, but I, I'm not sure where. Like I said, this, I want to say his name is Earl. This this Cato Potter that I know of. Um, he lives in Bing, which is actually where I lived. Um, Alan says we can't see. I'm sorry, Alan. I was I was hyper focused on my work and I forgot. Um, Granny Goose, my grandfather worked in the Forest Service in Arizona in Safford about 100 years ago. Ha, 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 I'm old. Um, yeah, so I worked for the Forest Service on the Sierra Vista Ranger District, and Safford is the same forest. It's Coronado, but it's different, different Ranger District. So uh, I worked in Safford uh, off and on while I was there. Uh, what is the cost of the shipping for the white clay? How can I make my red clay a darker red? Um, so I have a flat rate shipping on my website. So everything except big items, like if you order a pot, you'll pay more for shipping because it's large. Um, but my flat rate is $8. So if you order a gourd scraper or a bag of the white slip, the shipping is, is going to be $8. Um, and you can get a discount on your order. Um, my, my newsletter always has a 20% coupon in it. It comes out around the middle of the month. Uh, and last until the end of the month. So about half the time that's available. In fact, it's available now. You could go onto my Facebook page, uh, look at my newsletter, which is on there if you scroll down, um, get that discount code and, and use it. And that'll give you 20% off, but it, it doesn't apply to shipping. I mean, the post office doesn't give me a discount, that's for sure. Um, how can I make my red clay darker? Uh, you just have to find darker material, I would think. I mean, this is the stuff I'm using. This is, this is that... Um, that red ochre from them, from the Sierra Anches, all processed, and uh, it's it's really bright red. If I wanted a darker red, I you know I'd use some darker red. Now I for a workshop last year I ordered red iron oxide from Amazon. It's a little baggie of red iron oxide, and it was quite a bit darker than that. So you might be happy with that if you're looking for darker. I don't know. Um, Granny Goose, thank you so much for answering our questions, Andy. You're welcome. Uh, better late than never. Ren Pixies here. Uh, Wayne. Okay, guys. Um, let's see. If I can keep you guys in frame this time. Okay. You can see my work here. Uh, 
Here are my polishing stones. So I have a couple of different ones. This one came from the beach in California and it's not quite as glossy. Uh, and this one, uh, you know, this is uh, petrified wood that is polished and um, so it's really smooth. And this, I got this at the Tucson Gemma Mineral Show. I sell these on my website. So uh, when I first hit it, ah, fly, when I first hit it and it's pretty soft, right? I don't put any pressure. I'm, and it's not sticking to my stone. See, that's why I'm showing you that. Uh, I'm just, I'm just adding the weight of the stone only, and I'm going back and forth. And this is just kind of setting it in. And so, if I put much pressure, I'm going to start pulling up the slip, and I'll leave tracks in it. And I don't want to do that. If it is sticking to my stone a little, which it will sometimes, you can rub it off. Or rub it on your pant leg. I mean, if you have a pair of pants you don't care about. I mean, I, I just wear work pants, so I don't worry about it. I, it comes out in the wash. But um, you can rub it on a rag. You know, uh, if it's coming off a lot and you're leaving, like, little tracks through it, let it rest a little longer. So let me show you if I can show you the... Can you see the... Uh, I'm trying to get the angle. There you go. See what I'm talking about? See how there's just a little bit of gloss where I've gone over it. I'm not making it super shiny, but I am setting those iron particles into the clay. You see the gloss on that? It's just a little bit. And I'll go over the whole thing like that. And if you have a real good smooth stone, it won't leave, and you don't put any pressure, you can uh, you can go over the whole pot like that and kind of set that organic material. And then when it's drier, uh, once this dries a little more, then you can come back and you can put a little more pressure on it and you can get a nice gloss, you see, like like I got on this. Uh, and that was just because I polished this about three times. Uh, once when it was really soft like this, and then again when it was a little drier, and then right before it was completely dry, I, mean, got, I just got on it. And so um, that's how it works. And you can see, you can see little streaks with the brown showing through, right? And you can see the brown through it in places. Um, but that is exactly what you find in the, uh, in the ancient sherds. I should have brought some of the ancient sherds out uh, to show you today, and I'll do it another time. Uh, because I do have some shirts that I can show you and, and compare and this is really right and and then the way it kind of gets some fire clouds and some like areas that aren't oxidized as well areas that are this is really typical of what you see for the outside of Salata polychrome okay so uh, so we did the white and I told you I'll, I'll do another coat but I will not stone polish this I will leave it matte and that makes it a little more I think absorbent so the, the uh, organic paint soaks in um, and you will find in the prehistoric pottery that uh, it is seldom, if ever, polished. It's usually a matte finish. But the red is always polished. And the reason is it's just iron oxide and has to be polished in order to set it. So the red is polished, the white is not. Uh, let me go back to my camera. Uh, what's the key to boil plants down? Tried goldenrod, but it didn't gel. Yeah, I've never heard of anybody trying goldenrod, but it certainly was worth a try. Um, basically, just chop it up, throw it in a pot, just boil it, you know, for a couple hours. Boil it till it's a strong tea. Then, you know, strain out all the solids. I like to use um, a piece of cheesecloth or something really like a tight strainer to get all the chunks out. And then just cook it down until it is, um, you know, uh, like a syrup. So this is my yucca fruit that I'm going to use. Um, and so, I mean, if it doesn't gel, I don't try something else. I don't know what to tell you. Like I tried last year, last summer, I tried, um, there's a there's a plant that's related to Rocky Mountain bee plant called clammy weed. Rocky Mountain bee plant doesn't grow here in the southern southwest, but clammy weed grows all over the place. And it, it's closely related. And so I chopped up the clammy weed and I boiled it down and it didn't really, it didn't really gel either. It, it had some problems and I used it. One of the, uh, one of the paints on here is that clammy weed and, and it worked and it wasn't even very, you know, gooky like it. Uh, but I was ready to say, uh, it doesn't work very good. A, a friend of mine got clammy weed, boiled it down. He said it worked great. So sometimes if it doesn't work, maybe it's just your batch, right? Try again, uh, too. Um... Mark, uh, fire your red by itself, let it oxidize, it will become darker sometimes. Mark Gibson, Wayne, use wild lettuce for organic paint. That stuff grows everywhere and works amazing for organic black. Mm. Yeah, uh, that, that wild lettuce, like prickly lettuce, grows down here in 
southern Arizona in the winter, all winter long, you can find that stuff. Uh, same with tansy mustard. You find it in the cold months in the warm country. Uh, BJ, I've red iron but don't know how to mix it with the clay. Um, I just, just mix, you know, I just, if I'm mixing it with clay, like this is just water and iron oxide. But if you're mixing clay, you could just put the clay right in there with it and just let it soak and, and mix it up. I do that a lot of times, mixing clay with oxides. That's easy. Um, goldenrod did not work for me, says Alan Beal. Um, can you add another agent to thicken? Oh, yeah, lots of things, lots of things. So um, my favorite, well, um, so when I'm mixing um, mineral paint, I use, um, this is um, crystallized mesquite sap. And they're just little amber chunks. And these work really great for, for that. Now I wouldn't use this for organic paint because um, you know you never find more than a few little chunks of this stuff and you'd, just, you'd use it up too fast. And this stuff uh, is better for mineral paint because you just need a tiny amount. But for organic paint, I, like I said, I've used uh, all different plants. And I've even used stuff from the store like um, pancake syrup or Kung Pao sauce. I think you can use anything that's like sticky, like a, you know, like a syrup might work fine. Um, if it doesn't gel, can you add some white sugar? Um, maybe. Uh, I would. I wouldn't be surprised if that worked, or even just like I said, just like some Cairo or something, uh, might work great for that too. Um, okay, so I showed you the polishing. Uh, let's talk about painting real quick. I will uh, turn. How much time we have? Another 15 minutes? I can go over if I want. Um, so here's a pot that I slipped and this is all dry. Okay, so the red is, is um, polished on, bottom and top. The white is painted. You can see the brown showing through in a couple places. Like I said, you want to keep it thin. This is a fingerprint from when I was working on the red. I put some red on it, unfortunately. Now with the organic paint, uh, when it dries, it will dry to a plastic-like consistency. This is Rocky Mountain Bee Plant that Tori gave me. Just, I mean, it's it's just like plastic. It's hard. Um, so I will add a little water and let it soak. I added this, you know, an hour or two ago. Um, I had two brushes. Uh oh, it fell on the floor. Uh, so I added water an hour or two ago and let it sit so that it would soften. Um, I've got a, I've got a yucca brush here that's got too long a bristle, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna prune it a little with this pair of shears. Okay, there's my yucca brush. And uh, the other thing I do, so I, so I soak this ahead of time to soften it up, and I also soak my yucca leaves ahead of time to soften those fibers up too, uh, because they'll be quite stiff and rigid uh, at first. So this, they've both been soaking. And the other thing I want to tell you about this is uh, the water I add to my organic paint is uh, distilled water. Um, and that is because I add water to it and it evaporates. And, and I just leave it out until it evaporates. And then the next time I use it, I add more water to it. And then I leave it sit out and it evaporates. So if you're using hard water, uh, calcium will accumulate in your paint. Every time you add water, you're adding a little bit of calcium. <clears throat> and our water here in Tucson is very hard. Um, so, you know, the ancient people may have had similar problems, but uh, they weren't using, you know, groundwater that was being pumped from, you know, a thousand feet below the surface. It wasn't as hard as ours. So um, distilled water really helps uh, keep this paint usable for a longer time. And then uh, just get my brush, knock off the excess. And uh, these long brushes are useful because you can just pull a straight line. Okay, and again, just sometimes your paint is uh, is too thin, it's too liquidy, and it wants to run. Uh, in that case, you need to let it let that water kind of set and soak into your organic paint longer. Sometimes your paint is so thick you know, it doesn't even want to flow off the brush, in which case it needs more water added to it. You'll get a feel for it after a little while, you know, what your, what your paint needs and make sure that it's the right consistency. So 
like in a container this size, I've got a lot of paint in here and it's not all being hydrated at once. Just, just the top is, if, you know, down in there, it's still, you know, really hard. And so as it sits here, that water will soak into the other material and my paint will become thicker. So I have to keep, also, you know, it's, it's very dry here, so it, it's evaporating too. Um, so you have to keep adding water as you work to keep it a good consistency. And um, you'll get a feel for what you want after a little while. It, it is thick and you want it to be a little bit thick. Now I'm gonna add another line below this and then I'm gonna fill in. So what I want in the end is a nice thick solid line uh, just under the rim of this pot. Again, this is uh, this is made from the banana yucca. Uh, if you look it up online, it's the wide leaf yucca. It's not the same yucca I make the brushes out of. The brushes are made from the narrow leaf yucca uh, because they have more finer fibers. The, the wide leaf yucca has very coarse fibers, more like an agave, uh, the quality of the fibers. Uh, but it produces a fleshy fruit, whereas the, uh, the narrow leaf yucca does not produce a fleshy fruit. It produces kind of seed pods. Okay, so now I'm just going to fill in, in between, and I loaded my brush up probably more than I should have. I'm in a hurry, because that's how I operate. Um, sometimes I'm kind of an anxious person. Oh, I got an errant fiber. Look at that. What a mess. I can't believe I did that on camera, too. Now, if you watch that video of Tori that I made this summer, she made a mistake with her organic paint and she just went in with a little sponge and took it right off. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. But when I tried it, I just made a bigger mess. Like I just spread that stuff all over the place. So I don't know if it's uh, her slip, you know, her paint, that she was really fast with that sponge. I don't know. I'll have to ask her about it when I see her next time. Okay, so that's all I'm going to paint today because, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time. I don't want to bore you, but uh, that's how it works basically. And you don't, like I said, you don't want it to run. You don't want it to drip, uh, but it should go on sticky like syrup. It should be fairly sticky. All right. Let's go back to the uh, other camera. Okay, where are we here? Um, does Cleome, all Cleomes work, says Jeffrey Connolly. Bee plant is Cleome cerulata, but I have used several species successfully. Um, so Jeffrey, have you used clammy weed? Because that's, that is what we have in my area. And like I said, mine didn't come out so good. A friend of mine up in the Phoenix area had good success with clammy weed. Um, Cardis Leal, I'm trying to make my own bricks. What ratio of iron dust to clay for bricks? Iron dust in bricks? I don't have any experience with, with whites to be white. Um, if you over, uh, here's the thing, you've got a narrow window, right? If you under oxidize, under oxidize, you're firing. Um, then your pottery comes out gray. Now this bowl is slightly under oxidized. So if you look, you will notice that it's not really white. The white is kind of gray. Now there's a spot, see, in that area up by the rim up here, that's whiter. But in the middle, see, it's grayer. It's because um, every outdoor firing has, un has different firing atmospheres. So when you first start it and the fire is flaming a lot, it is reducing. There's not much oxygen in there. And your pottery will absorb carbon out of the atmosphere and it will become very dark and sooty and gray and kind of smudged, right? Oh, 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 I forgot to change. Look at that. I'm sorry, guys. I'm a knucklehead. All right. <laughs> now you can see me. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so here we, I'll show you again. So here in this area, it is whiter, right? It oxidized a little more. But here in the bottom, it's very gray, right? 
It didn't oxidize enough. So in the beginning of a firing, when that fire is really burning actively, there's not much oxygen in there, and that pottery is absorbing carbon out of the atmosphere, and, and it will get very sooty and dark. And then, as the fire starts burning to coals, you can watch, if you, if you stack the wood so you can see the pottery, uh, it will start cleaning up, and that, those grays will start turning white. Now you're oxidizing, right? So burning that carbon, so you wanna burn all the carbon out of the surface, you know, before you shut it down, and, and you, want it, you want it to start looking white. There's a couple places on this pot that are a little gray too, like on this side over here. It's a little on the gray side, okay? This pot here is pretty clean. It doesn't have any of those gray spots, right? So that's what we're looking for. We wanna burn all that carbon out of there and have it clean. So there's a window. You can under oxidize and end up with gray. You can over oxidize. Now here's a test pot I did last year and this had different slips on it, but you over oxidize, you literally burn that organic paint right out of there and have nothing but like gray designs on it, okay? So under oxidized, over oxidized. What we're shooting for is right in the middle, right? Bright black, nice black, black designs, nice white, white organic paint, right? We want our reds to turn red. So that's what we're going for. And like I said, it's 680 to 720. That, you know, and not, not more than, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. So that's what we're going for. Let me show you, do we have any questions here? Camera angle still down. Yeah, I got that. You cannot see it. No worries. Um, uh, let me show you my video real quick. If I can remember to do this correctly, right? Let's see. Um, okay, so uh, here I am. I'm setting the pottery up, stacking it upside down so that the coals fall on the red side and uh, leave fire clouds there instead of on the design, right? So stacking the, and, and leaving airspace because those pots are stacked on stones over the hot coals so we get lots of air circulation around it. The air is really important because the way those pots heat up predominantly is convection, hot air, okay? So airspace is important to getting those clean colors, those bright whites, bright reds. Uh, now I'm stacking the wood over the top and I'm not, this one is actually a little bit over fueled. There's literally a little too much fuel on this. You don't wanna put a lot of wood. You want it pretty open. You wanna use small material, smaller than your wrist or no larger than your wrist, how about that? And, and keep it open so there's lots of air can move through there. You should be able to look through and still see the pots, not just see all wood. You want to light it all the way around at the same time because you want it to all burn the coals at the same time. So it's important to use a good mix of fuel all the way around and the same kind of fuel and it'll make sure it lights all the way around at the same time. Uh, no shard, that's right. That's not because a lot of polychrome always has uh, fire clouds on the outside which tells you that the fuel is landing on top of the pottery. No cover shirts. That's right. Uh, and then I'm using my infrared thermometer to measure the temperature. And if I see that it's in that you know, 680 to 720 area. This is how I'm doing this. I'm pulling the wood away. I'm saying that's enough. I'm stopping the firing, okay, by pulling the wood off of it. Uh, and so it's really important to keep an eye. Now here's the finished pottery I pulled out of the fire and then I'll show you uh, wiping the ash off the pot. So when you pull these out, that organic paint will have ash on it. So look at this bowl covered in ash. See that? Doesn't look that great. Use a rag. Wipe the ash off and voila, black designs. So that's the thing is uh, that, that paint, that organic paint will, will form ash that then you have to wipe off. So it might not look that good at first, but it is actually good once you get through it. Okay. Um, so that, uh, that is the firing. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. I've been looking for this for a while now. Please come visit Shoal, New Mexico and make some pots with us here. Find most of our ingredients here on my ranch. Uh, where where is Shoal? I'm probably mispronouncing it. Where is that, Jeffrey? Um, what part of New Mexico? Is that the one you said was out by uh, Salinas National Park? What Jeffrey said, but Ohio. <laughs> Ohio is a long way from here. I don't know about that. My wife wants me to go out to um, um, Oklahoma and Missouri next month, so that's probably my next vacation. Amazing. Thank you, Andy. Clarity of that design is striking. Good. Um, I'm glad you guys got something out of this. Uh, do we have questions? Because I think I covered all the material uh, that I had. Oh, oh, um, so uh, 
this was Bobby's, remember, a wrong slip. So, you know, you have to have the right slip. Um, you have to make sure uh, you don't under oxidize and you also don't want to over oxidize, right? Right materials on the, the right materials and then the right firing process. Uh, really brief, really low temperature firing. Those are the keys. Um, so if we have questions about any of that or anything else regarding um, road trips. Yeah. Ren Pixie, I have done nothing but uh, travel all summer. I was up um, up in, in your country, Ren Pixie, up you know in St. John's and, and Sholo and up there uh, s several times this summer. Then I made the trip up to Hopi uh, to make that video about Bobby Silas. And then I was down at Q Ranch to do my workshop. And then I was home for like two weeks and then I had to go up to the Kiln Conference in Utah. And then I was home and then I was just out at my property in southeast, far southeast Arizona for a week doing that workshop. And now I'm home again. I have another work. My mug workshop is next week. Uh, so, And then after that, I'm, I may be taking a trip with my wife out to, like I said, Oklahoma and Missouri. So no rest. Uh, <laughs> I've definitely put the miles on my truck and my trailer this summer. Can you fire with a charcoal pile? Uh, I would assume. I've never tried it, but... Um, if you watch that video, I think it was about three or four videos back that I made about four ways to fire pottery. Um, you can see that Tony Sora is firing with lump charcoal and a few bricks, but you could do something along that. See, the bricks would at least hold that charcoal up against the pottery. But check that out because that might be the way to do it if you wanted to fire with uh, charcoal. And the thing about the charcoal firing is um, no smoke, no flames. So, you know, you can do it right in your yard. Nobody's going to call the fire department on you. They smell it. They just think you're having a barbecue. Uh, love the video on Bobby. Yeah, Bobby's a great guy. Um, Mark Gibson, thanks again, Andy. Enjoy your vacation. I mean, thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, so I got a couple minutes left. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I can uh, I can show you my material again. So this is my this is my gray. Uh, this is going to be my white slip uh, when I when it fires. So this will fire. Uh, this color. This is that same gray material. So you can never tell what a, what a clay is going to be before it fires. That's for sure. And it starts out you know, this purple material. Oh, it's gray, but I mean it has a little bit of a purple cast to it. And Ren Pixie, this is in your neighborhood, right here. Uh, in fact, it's on the map I gave you earlier this summer. Uh, and then, uh, and then my red, my red ochre, which comes from Sierra Anches. I mix it up with the uh, liquid. Okay, and you, uh, you can use your, you could use red iron oxide that you could purchase at a ceramic supply store, uh, and then again your organic paint can be made out of a bunch of stuff. This is yucca fruit, uh, which works real good for me. I also like mesquite beans; so probably my two favorites, um, at least right now. But try what works in what grows in your neighborhood. <laughs> How do you get a deep blue? Uh, you don't. Yeah. So uh, at least. From what I know, blue and green are the two colors that you can't really achieve using natural materials. Uh, I believe every time you see a blue or a green on like Pueblo or Mata Ortiz pottery, they're using like, you know, some kind of underglaze. I don't believe that is natural. Um, I saw a Maria Martinez video, says Rebecca, where they used old metal cafeteria trays to reflect the fire's heat back inward. Do you ever use anything like that? Yeah, the point of that isn't really to reflect the fire back inward. It's to keep the fuel off of the pottery. So it kind of adds a layer of protection and also lets that air space in place. So if you put, basically I use cover shirt. So I use a, a like a big piece of a broken pot or I'll make like a large, like make a slab and drape it over something so it's a little bit rounded. And I'll place those around the pottery to protect it from the fuel. That keeps the fuel from touching the pottery so you don't get fire clouds. But it also maintains that air space. So you get good air circulation because that fuel isn't like, closing in on the pottery. So yeah, then that, that's what they were using those cafeteria trays and license plates for in, in Maria Martinez day. Nowadays, you know, cafeteria trays are made out of fiberglass and license plates are made out of aluminum. So it doesn't work, but uh, yeah, pieces of metal that the Pueblos will still use that. Um, so yeah, do you ever do anything? Yeah. So, uh, you work amazed me. Your videos and Tony Soares have inspired and taught me so much says Granny Goose. Thanks Granny Goose. Ren Pixie. Yep. Picked up about five gallons for processing. Good deal. A decomposing apple. Hi from Tucson, Arizona. Thanks for making these videos. Love the knowledge that you share with us. Hey, decomposing apple. Hello from Tucson yourself. 
Uh, thanks, Andy. We will polish my white slip. Will not polish my white slip like the under ox and over ox. Yeah, well, that's really the key to remembering how to fire this is, is to know that you're shooting for that window and, and know where you're going. Uh, and having one of those little infrared guns really helps because then I can I can check that temp and know when I'm where I need to be. Uh, but you can do it without it. You have to look in and, and try to see when the pottery is clean when you burn the carbon off. Um, what about blue or blackberry? What? Oh, oh, like for paint. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've used yucca fruit or prickly pear. Certainly, I would think you could use any kind of a fruit or berry and boil it down to syrup, I would think. I, I mean, I haven't tried it, but try it yourself. Um, Granny Goose, I used a rusty piece of metal as a cover shirt and got an interesting yellowish blush. <laughs> you actually picked up iron oxide off of that piece of metal. Interesting. Maybe mixed with turquoise. No, uh, no. Um, I'll show you what I did here. I've got this little test tile. It's a little dusty. Okay. So I fired this. Uh, I painted this with different uh, minerals that I found in my area, and then I fired it. So uh, I'll show you what I've got, okay? This is like a turquoise material. This is what you call copper carbonate. So turquoise is by nature hard, so it doesn't make good paint because it just breaks into chunks. You want something soft like a malachite, azurite, chryscola. So these copper carbonates, they are similar colors to turquoise, but are softer. So this is painted with copper. Copper in an oxidizing atmosphere will turn gray or black, okay? This is limonite. This is yellow uh, iron hydroxide, okay? So yellow material will turn red. This is white clay. So the best way to get white, the, about the only way to get white is to use white clay. And this is iron oxide. This is red hematite, right? And this is manganese dioxide. So manganese turns black, uh, iron oxide turns red, white clay turns white, uh, yellow iron oxide, iron hydroxide turns red, and uh, the copper actually does not stay blue or green in an oxidizing fire. And if you reduce your copper, uh, where's that pot? What did I do with that pot? No, well, it's probably in the house. I made this cylinder. Dang, I can't believe it's in the house. Here, I got a little bit on this one. So, so this is my canteen I fired at the Kiln Conference. And um, this was painted with my standard um, manganese clay and copper paint, which is rock solid for me. I fire it in an oxidizing atmosphere and I get black every time. Like black, black, really good. But I threw this in the trench kiln and it reduced. And my manganese went brown, which it'll do in reduction. And you see that kind of reddish tint on there? That's what, that's what copper will sometimes do in reduction. So um, copper's weird stuff. Uh, it makes a good black in oxidation. It does weird stuff in reduction. Um, how you get blue or green, I, I have no idea. I mean, I'm sure they do it with like, you know, glazes and stuff, so it's doable. Maybe it's not doable at the temperatures at which I fire or the kind of atmospheres that I have available to me. I don't know. Um, do you ever burnish similar to Doro Dango? I don't know what Doro Dango is, but uh, I do burnish. Yeah, in fact, I was showing burnishing earlier on this red pot. Now, this is real soft, but it will get shiny uh, like this later on. Um, Michael, before you end uh, the stream, your video helped me a lot because I was a beginner. Thanks. I'm glad to help, Michael. Uh, Jeffrey, I used a very old galvanized bucket for a cover shirt, and the zinc on it turned the pot a beautiful green in places. Weird. See, I've used galvanized buckets for cover shirts. I've never had any. The galvanized turns kind of yellow, but I've never had it affect the pottery in any way. Uh, cobalt for blue. Maybe, maybe, but, I mean, cobalt doesn't exist naturally here in Arizona that I'm aware of. Uh, Chris in Kansas, cobalt oxide is used to create blue slip glazes. Not sure how abundant it is. Yeah, and it's really poisonous, too, the way I understand it. Japanese clay ball. Uh, can I glaze a pot with clay and water? I don't know anything about glaze. You're talking to the wrong person. I, I've never glazed anything. Um, so not the right guy for that. Oh, it's five minutes after, guys. Uh, do me a favor and smash the like button for me, people, please. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take off. I really appreciate all you coming by today, and I hope you got something out of it. All right? Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.